Hello and welcome to Red's Business and Technology Podcast. I'm your host, Jackson Barnes. And I'm your co-host, Brad Ferris. And today we're sitting down with Lane Rausch, who's the Senior Vice President of Global Sales Engineering for Arctic Wolf, and Steve Craig, who's the Chief Sales Officer from Arctic Wolf. We're looking forward to this episode. We're going to get some good insights to the cybersecurity industry over in the US and globally. Um, Steve and Lane, thanks for joining us. Mate, Steve, did you want to start uh, with an introduction to yourself and your background? Yeah, absolutely. Jackson, Brad, thanks for having us. I uh, really appreciate the the time and look forward to the, the partnership ahead. Um, so Steve Craig, Chief Sales Officer, I've been with Arctic Wolf for going on close to four years. Uh, when I joined, uh, we were about 200 employees and uh, we had a sales team of about 20, 20 sellers. And, uh, you know, fast forward three and a half, four years later, and I think we're well over 2,000 employees and a, a team well well north of 200 sellers. So, uh, you know, I've, I've grown in responsibility and scope. I have responsibility for acquisition. I go to market globally. Uh, we're 100% channel, so uh, when we move into a new region or new uh, part of the world, we're selling to our channel partners exclusively, uh, and then I have responsibility for our sales development and sales uh, enabling teams here at Google. Thanks, Steve. With that title and that amount of growth, you are definitely dominating your job. Lane, mate, did you want to introduce yourself and uh, your background before you join Arctic Wolf and how long you've been there? Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. So, so my name is Lane Rausch, and yeah, I run all sales engineering at Arctic Wolf. Um, I've been here for about seven years. I was employee around 35. Um, so I've seen a lot of growth in the uh, managed detection response market. Um, really, it was identified in May of 2016, and I joined Arctic Wolf in August of 2016. Um, my background is, is really primarily been on the, uh, you know, hands-on keyboard type si- si- situation, right? So I've been a system administrator in the infrastructure for a long time. So prior to being in sales and sales engineering, you know, I was in storage, compute. I mean, I was playing with virtualization when it was, you know, ESX2, uh, you know, took over migrated exchange boxes, ran help desks, have done storage array management. So I am a through and through infrastructure guy. Um, my first uh, foray into sales engineering was uh, really around, uh, I went to EMC and was actually sell- selling data domain, Avamar and, and networker. So think backup software. Um, after I, I had a stint at EMC, I went to uh, Code 42 and did enterprise endpoint backup. Um, and, and really there is where I got introduced into uh, what I would consider security um, from, a, from a professional perspective. And I thought it was really interesting because we, we came from this spot of backup and disaster recovery, you know, as, as, you know, a part of anybody's ecosystem or any company's ecosystem that's required. Um, and DR, even back in the day, was hard to implement and hard to do. Um, but now nobody would operate without DR, right, or business continuity. Like, that's not even really heard of anymore. Um, and, and when I was at Code, we decided, hey, look, there's millions of endpoints on these systems that are taking every version of every file. Um, what can we do from a security context? And so that's when I really started getting into this idea of what does security and InfoSec and cybersecurity look like? Um, and and when, I, when I took my next jump, you know, I really wanted to get into something that was obviously subscription. I wanted it to be something that was security focused. Um, and ultimately for me, I wanted to go build out and, and, and run a sales engineering organization. And, you know, I was lucky enough to get uh, get the opportunity here at Arctic Wolf to, you know, really try to drive and make a difference uh, within within uh, the cybersecurity industry. So it's been it's been a great run so far. And, you know, we have a lot of work left to do, but really excited about what we have to come. Yeah, that's, that's exciting, and, and you've seen a lot of growth in your time, 35, 35th employee to now, uh, where Arctic Wolf's got, what, 2,000 employees globally, so that's um, that's quite a lot to have happened, I'd say, in those years in your, your timeline. <laughs> Probably the first thing I want to start with to get some context for listeners would be, who is Arctic Wolf? Um, who, I don't know which one of you wants to take that question. Yeah, I, I, I'll, I'll take it, and then you know Steve can add on if I, if I need some help. So, you know, Ar- Arctic Wolf is really uh, a company that is is about – trying to end cyber risk within a company. And, and look, I think we all know if you've been in security, uh, really, or in IT or the life, you can't ever eliminate risk. Like, it's not something you can actually ever eliminate. But the idea is that if we can strive towards a mission of trying to end risk within companies, which is really around reducing the likelihood of a security incident happening and reducing the impact when a security incident happens, um, we are going to make our customers more secure, right? And so Arctic Wolf's uh, mission has been 
Um, let's deliver the outcome uh, of security operations to companies with you know, a security operations cloud that isn't just about technology, right? It's not about here's another product that's a little more efficate. It's about how we deliver the outcome, which we know you can't automate the human out of a sock, right? And so the idea for us has been how do we still uh, operate in a, in a fashion that's affordable and effective for customers, but also deliver outcomes and not just necessarily another product. And, and that's held true uh, even since really kind of the inception of Arctic Wolf of delivering outcomes versus, uh, you know, a net new product, if you will. Yeah, I would just pile on. Look, I, you know, we work with customers to solve an important, an important challenge and it's, it's not an easy one. It's a complex, uh, it's a complex relationship. And, uh, you know, we approach it not, not just from a, a tool or a product, right? It's, it's the nature of the relationship. We have a tactical and a strategic relationship and we really want to partner with our customers. Uh, and it's a journey, right? It's not a point in time. It's not a place we get to. It's a, it's a long-term relationship. And our goal is really to be an extension uh, of our customers and, and help them through a, a journey that, that takes a lot of twists and turns and is constantly evolving. Yeah, that, and I think um, Australians or, or down under as the US, uh, <laughs> USA, we, uh, we're definitely getting more cyber conscious this year in particular. There's been, uh, you're probably aware, there's been a, a lot of massive breaches like uh, Optus and Medibank and that kind of thing that happened. And um, the thing that general business sentiment uh, in Australia has changed drastically this year around cyber. So it was a perfect time for you to enter the Australian market. And uh, Red's very excited about partnering with Arctic Wolf and, and helping end cyber risk down under as well. So just um, to elaborate further on the Arctic Wolf story, um, what's the purpose of Arctic Wolf? Yeah, so I mean, obviously, you know, we talked about who we are and I think, you know, for, for us, it really is about how we drive risk down within customers. So how do we make them safe? And and the, the, the purpose for us is how do you do that in a way that is affordable but effective, right? Because the challenge is um, the idea of, for a company to be able to go out and say, hey, look, I'm going to be able to uh, build out and staff a 24-7 security operations center. I'm going to be able to, you know, review the environment tactically from, you know, looking at all of the data and filtering out the noise and getting to uh, an, an outcome. But there's also the strategic side. And I think, you know, the, the ultimately for Arctic Wolf is how do we go into a business and a company and how do we take them from where they're at today from a security posture perspective and how do we make them more secure? I mean, it is as simple as that. The challenge though to do that is not simple, right? All mm -hmm. of the different technologies and the processes and procedures and workflows and right the, the integration points, it, it's a hard job. And if you're trying to do it yourself, um, there's also the whole human component. Like even if you want to do it, can you do it? And so, you know, the, the point of Arctic Wolf is functionally, like I liken it like this. Most companies anymore, don't run their own exchange servers, their own email systems, right? So this idea of, you know, hey, I just want to use email. Well, I'm going to probably use a cloud-based email service anymore just because I just want to use email. I don't want to run the systems. I don't want to manage the systems. Well, security operations really for me is no different, which is I just want to know I'm safe, right? I just want to know that I'm protected. I want to know that I am becoming more secure. I want to know that I am fighting against the criminals out there and I'm standing up, up to them day to day. I just want the outcome. I just, I just want to know that that's happening versus how do I do this all myself? And, you know, I know, I know Steve Hunter uh, did a really good job of talking about core versus context. Like that is, that is the idea is, you know, I call it core versus chore, but if, if it's not core to your business to run a security operations platform and invest the amount of money and time and resources it takes to actually battle and fight the criminals, then, then you probably shouldn't do it even though you still need the outcome. You would never run your business without email or a CRM. You shouldn't run your business without a SOC either, but that doesn't mean you have to go do it yourself, right? And I think that ultimately that is the point of Arctic Wolf is how you deliver that outcome without you having to go and do it yourself. Yeah, that's that's definitely true. And we, we see that, we manage the IT for a lot of businesses. And I think um, generally boards and CFOs just want the outcome. And uh, I think it, it probably was the case 10 years ago or beyond that, they would just go to their internal IT team or their MSP to get that. But um, it, it's evolved a lot and um, hence a lot of growth of Arctic Wolf. Um, so something I want to touch on, Steve, this is probably a question for you. Um, what do you think the market share is of security operations or outsourced security operations globally um, currently versus what it's going to look like in three years' time? Yeah, great, great question. 
Uh, so, you know, building a SOC, right, historically and now has been reserved for, I would say, large organizations that have the resources, they have the budgets, they have the ability to go hire and dedicate eight, 12, 50, hundreds, right, of employees to, to managing and operationalizing a SOC 24 seven around the globe or in the region. Um, if, if you rewind back in time, when I first started at Arctic Wolf in 2019, you know, and Gardner still to this day has not done a magic quadrant for the MBR market, but they have produced a market guide. Um, back in 2019, I think they were projecting somewhere around 25% industry adoption by 2024, 2025. Um, each year in their market guide, 2020 and 2021, they've increased those projections. And I think the last market guide in 2021, they were suggesting that we would see roughly 50% market adoption for MBR services uh, by 2025. So we're still early. Uh, MDR has certainly you know, taken a, a move in the market to offer customers that don't have the budgets to go hire a team of even three individuals to do SOC or 24 seven monitoring across the environment, uh, an affordable way to uh, answer the question, you know, are we safe? And do we have the ability to respond to an incident if and then we need to in the middle of the night? Well, that's good insights. And it's, it's probably a good little segue. Um, MDR, managed Detection Response Industry, um, there is a lot of plays in that space and, and because of that, uh, I guess, market share is going to grow significantly. What's the core difference between Arctic Wolf's service and typical or traditional MDR vendors? Yeah, yeah there's you want several to see- layers to this. I Lane and I can probably offer a couple of different uh, you know, perspectives. I think, you know, tools, you know, there's a lot of approaches with organizations can buy their own tool stack to go ahead and operationalize this internally and kind of DIY sock, if you will. Uh, there's a lot of vendors that have come to market with sort of a blend of tools and, and service. I think we've always approached the outcome and the, the solution uh, by offering a service and a strategic partnership, which I think does differentiate how we go to market versus some of the, the other competitors out there. I mean, I'll, I'll pass over to you for a couple other points. Yeah, so I think, I think uh, Jackson, the key here is the type of competitor, right? So the, the, the challenge is, is over the course of the last seven years, you know, it's almost been like, oh, if you have a security technology, let's just put M in front of it and now we're MBR, right? Whether that's a yeah. piece of network technology, just an endpoint technology, an off a technology, right? So so the idea is really about like who we're talking about from the competitive landscape. But, but one of the core fundamentals that we have always had at Arctic Wolf is the concept of broad visibility, right? So you know, this concept of XDR has been around in our minds for a long time, right? And so, so this idea of, you know, I want to be able to look at more than just one attack surface. And I want to basically be able to monitor and detect and try to respond, whether that is guided remediation, or, you know, you'd be able to do things like host-based containment or whatever. The idea is that, like, for us, broad visibility has always been a core foundation. And that's not always true of other competitors, right? A lot of competitors are now starting to move into that space of, hey, I can't just have it be endpoint or just network or just auth or just cloud. So they're trying to basically build out their, their portfolio to, to offer more. Um, the, other, the other thing that I think has been, you know, differentiating for us has been um, we're, we're, we try to be very vendor neutral as much as we can, right? Which means we do bring our own technology to bear, But we can also service customers without them being on the Arctic Wolf tech stack as it stands today, right? So, like, if you've invested in, you know, one of the top five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten firewalls or endpoint solutions, we're going to use that as part of our service, meaning we can still deliver a service to you without you necessarily having to rip out your existing investments, right? Which is really helpful in the the marketplace. Um, but, but then you switch. So I'm talking about like those are almost like big companies with tools that are starting to build MDR type services on top of their tool sets. But there's an entirely other category that are, that are competition, which I would consider are more um, uh, kind of the traditional MSSPs, right, that are going to go through and maybe try to do co-managed SIM setups or they're going to build an MDR service wrapped around a third party technology or tool. Um, and I think that where, where this starts to, to differentiate is scale. So, you know, if I rewind back in from Arctic Wolf's perspective, if I rewind when I was, you know, seven years ago, we had a hundred customers, right? We had our SOC was small. It was just enough to be 24 seven, right? Mm -hmm. But what happens is, is as you grow and as you scale and you are able to make investments and you're right. So we've been 
given a good chunk of money and invested a good chunk of money in delivering nothing but this outcome, which means we have the ability to do things like um, take tactical items off of our strategic CSTs and then put focus there. And if you're able to put focus and resource on the specific functions, they're inherently going to be better than trying to do everything at once, right? So I'll give you an example. So our concierge security team that does strategic outcomes with our customers and our partners, you know, they aren't, they aren't responsible for deploying the system, right? We have an entire deployment team that is getting it up to speed and ready to go before we hand it off to the security team. That's not the same when you're talking about maybe a smaller organization that has 12 to 20 max people that are the security people. They're managing the tools. They're doing the deployment, right? They're, they're kind of doing everything. And I think the key is, is, is you can scale different functions, threat research, triage functions. You start getting a scale effect, which means you're going to be more efficient and effective because you're focusing in areas that, frankly, if you don't invest the money in the people, you won't ever be as good. Mm. Oh, I was actually going to ask a little follow-up question. Like you mentioned... MDR is um, confusing, and I've definitely noticed that. We're pretty early in the uh, partnership with with Red um, entering the Australian market, and I'd say it is quite confusing for IT managers and CIOs and people who are going to market for, for I guess, helping end their internal cyber risk because there is a lot of vendors who, uh, like you said, just put an M or an X in front of their offering, and now, now they are uh, managed detection response or XDR, uh, and it gets really, really confusing. So, Brad, before I get over to you, Brad, man, what, what, Lane, what questions would you ask internally if you are looking to um, you know, mitigate cyber risk and you're speaking to Arctic Wolf, but potentially a couple of other vendors, um, how do you differentiate? Yeah, so I, internally, the first thing I would ask is, like, am I looking for a tool or a service? Like, it, it, seriously, it's the first thing you have to ask yourself as a business, which is, am I looking for the outcome or am I looking for access and I want to build this capability myself? It's the first thing you have to ask because as you go down this evaluation process, that becomes a very important point. The next level for me becomes like, what does my existing tool set look like? And what attack surfaces do I believe in my business are, are important? Now, I will, in my opinion, you have endpoint, you have auth, you have cloud, you have network. Those are kind of four components. Then you have the human side, right? Those five are really essential attack surfaces. So the next question I would ask is, who am I looking at? Are they going to cover the broad attack surface, right? Are they actually doing triage and forensics 24 seven across those attack surfaces? Or is it, they can ingest some of that data, but they're only actually triaging specific sets. Like that, that's important, right? Because you want to make sure you're getting alerted regardless of where they're at. So attack surface. And then I would say the last one is, what is my internal security maturity? Like what, like for me as a business, what am I looking for in the relationship with this service provider? Obviously making the assumption that, that you decided you wanted a service and not a tool, because it is going to come become very apparent that you are going to have to know like, okay, yes, I want alerts. And yes, I want to know if I'm safe but how am I going to move the needle? Because that stuff is going to help identify things, but how am I going to move the needle to reduce the likelihood of these things happening? And if, and, and how, like, so my question back would be, how is the partner that you're getting into as an MDR offering broad coverage, neutral and vendor in my environment. And honestly, like how are they delivering a strategic outcome? And in my opinion, the whole idea of detection and response across multiple attack surfaces is becoming more commoditized. Right? Like it is, it's not, you shouldn't call yourself, in my opinion, an MDR vendor if you're just looking at one or two attack surfaces. Like you can, but I, I think you're doing a little bit of a disservice to the market. I agree. Yeah. However, if you're doing all of them, then it becomes a strategic conversation. So I guess that's kind of a good segue um, there into, you know, how, how, what is the difference between that Arctic Wolf service and, and that of your competitors? Yeah. And again, I think, uh, so again, if you have, if you have more data and more telemetry, it just means that you're going to have eyes in more spots in the environment, right? Yeah. So it doesn't mean that like, let's say, let's say I can ingest Microsoft Defender data, right? And I can get it and I have it in the system and I can search it and it's there. But if it's not operationalized through the SOC and I can alert on it, like, are we sure that that's really the MDR function? No, it's probably not, right? So, so Brad, I think just making sure that when we talk about what we support and what we ingest, it isn't just what's in the technology. It's also about what you've operationalized through the human workflow. That's the, that's the tactical side or a big difference. 
But the other side, and this is, and we, you, you, you'll probably get sick of hearing about this, <laughs> but this idea of a concierge security team, a security journey, like walking a customer through and helping them identify areas within their environment that can help them become more secure. It, it is one of the reasons customers come to Arctic Wolf. Yep. And more importantly, I believe it's one of the reasons customers stay with Arctic Wolf. Yep. Right? So we have a strong technology platform that drives all of our security operations, but having that high touch strategic function within our customer base, it really helps both sides of the, the aisle. Yeah, to know. be constantly improving that security posture of, uh, of, of the client's business ultimately. A big part too, like our go-to-market, sometimes you don't think about your go-to-market when you answer that question, what differentiates you from your competitors, but uh, our, our channel go-to-market has been really important for our customers, right? I think a lot of times organizations, they lean on partners like Red to bring really valuable, critical, mission-critical services to the table. And um, you know, we found a great way to bring our service, our security operations platform to market via our key partners that have a lot of trusted relationships. And it does differentiate um, how we're working together with partners and customers alike to. Mm, that's an interesting choice, but it, it does make a lot of sense going through through channel instead of um, direct. So a little bit of a segue. Um, Point back to you, Lane. When um, you started Arctic Wolf seven and a bit years ago, what did the cybersecurity industry look like um, compared to now? It's a great question. So I'll try to I'll try not to be super long, but, but <laughs> we'll luck. see. <laughs> good luck. Um, but so so the key here is that what, what I found was security really uh, evolved in this idea of like becoming a function of IT, right? So what I mean by that is. You know, if I was a director of IT, a VP or a CIO, for a long time, my entire job was to make sure that users, customers of theirs, right, business business applications were up and running, right? I was delivering technology for them to use. I was delivering, you know, uptime to make sure web servers were running, all of that stuff. And, and what happened is, is people in IT got really good at it, right? We were, like, efficient and effective and things were up and running and we were making people more efficient. And then all of a sudden, security became a really hot topic in the, in the market, right? Whether that was because we saw the first ransomware set up where it was like, oh my gosh, this can actually take off entire you know, businesses offline. And what happened very quickly was, oh wow, just like previously, I didn't have a disaster recovery plan. Now it's like, wait, I don't have a security plan. And the challenge was companies and businesses were like, okay, well, the things that we're trying to secure, IT runs, so okay, you're also going to be the security people, right? Well, the challenge is, is unless you've been a practitioner in security, implementing a SOC or security processes is a lot different than, than IT, right? So I always liken it to like knock time and SOC time, right? Knock time is web service died. Better get that thing restarted or you're losing money. Where on the SOC side, you're like, ooh, there's an Active Directory alert. You're not just going to shut down Active Directory without doing the work to confirm that there's a real problem or not, right? And so they're, they're really two different mindsets and two different functions. And so what I saw back then, Jackson, was really a struggle for this, like, this person in IT going, I don't, like, I'm now in charge of security, but I don't know what to do. Fast forward to where we're at today, and I think that there's a lot more maturity in this market around what security options there are. Example, um, when I first started, this idea of MDR being an option for a company that was over 500 employees, like wasn't really, a, like it wasn't an option, right? Because they were going to go buy a SIM and do it themselves because that's what IT people do. They buy technology, they implement it, they set it up, and then they, they let it run without the knowledge that it takes a lot more than that when you're talking about a SOC. Fast forward, now you're seeing MDR security operations as an, as, a, as an augmentation or an outsource of your capabilities as a viable option for some of the largest of the large companies, right? And so the evolution of maturity and what capabilities you can bring into bear, it, it, it's, it's markedly different than it was seven years ago. Mm, that's some good insights. And I do agree that even, even technology, right? So we, we focus on more the technology side of businesses at Red and, um, I'd say that internal teams uh, is are quite are quite struggling these days because say they've got two or three engineers. Um, IT engineers these days are, are mostly generalists, and before five years ago, ten years ago, were all generalists. But now that you need specialist networking, specialist cloud, specialist security, it's it's quite hard to build an end to end internal IT team because there is so many different services. So it makes sense that you've got you know partners like R2 of where you can outsource cert certain functions too. Uh, mate, I've done a lot of talking, Brad. Over to you, mate. Do you want to ask the next question? 
Yeah, so I guess it's um, carrying on from what the past and, and, and now moving into the future. So, you know, what do you guys see the the future of the of the industry look like? Yeah, that's an interesting one. You know, uh, you know, as the industry's matured, right, and adoption has increased, you know, cyber insurance has been a bit of a driver here in the States. And I think, you know, a lot of the carriers are, are global in nature. I think what they've learned in the States will likely be applied internationally, including you know, Australia over time. And, you know, if, if you look back to 2021, your carriers paid out close to 80% of premiums, I believe, in, in 2021. And it, it was a... <laughs> A period of time in which it was really easy to get a cyber insurance policy. There wasn't a lot of diligence that went into scrutinizing what controls were or were not in place. And as a result, you know, as ransomware attacks rose, uh, right, carriers naturally paid out a higher percent of premiums, and that's not a sustainable business model. And you know, 2021 into 2022, we saw carriers take a significantly different approach to requiring a significant level of controls be in place before they would underwrite a policy. And that really shook up the market here in the States over the last year, year and a half. And I think we're still seeing that mature. And you know, you, we actually saw a reduction in, in total number of, of attacks uh, in, in 2022 so far. Not necessarily the case in Australia, right? They saw a rise, probably the largest yeah. rise across the globe. Um, but I, I do think some of what we learned in the states around cyber insurance controls that needed to be in place will will make its way more broadly across the globe. It's certainly things like multi-factor authentication, it's user awareness training, uh, it's network monitoring, right? It's it's 24/7 detection response, it's endpoint capabilities, it's it's firewalls. It's a lot of the basics yep. that you'd expect, you know, a lot of organizations to have in place and it's it's sort of um, lending credibility to the, to the need to take security Seriously. Have you seen yeah, that across any of the other regions that you're operating in? So, you know, kind of starting in the States, are you starting to see that more in, in the other regions that you're operating in, Europe, EMEA, et cetera? We're, we're starting to see it make its way into the, the Canadian market. It's coming up in conversation here and there in Australia. Uh, but the, the nature of the, so we, you know, we, we acquired Tetra in February of this past year, Tetra really brought uh, an end to end, you know, digital forensics, incident response capability uh, to Arctic Wolf. And, uh, you know, it, it really rounded out our offering. And, you know, we've learned a lot as a result of having Tetra uh, become part of Arctic Wolf. And, you know, we learn a lot from the front lines, what's happening, types of attacks mm. and techniques. Uh, but Tetra's business is heavily reliant on carrier sourced IR cases. And, those carriers, right, again, they're global in nature. And I think these businesses are going to apply the same controls yeah. that they put uh, in place in the U.S. Uh, globally over time. Steve, so you said uh, over in the U.S. it's shaking up the market and asking a lot more questions before you can get cyber insurance. Are you seeing – what are you seeing? We're seeing some businesses in Australia uh, opting – particularly large ones actually – opting to self-insure and actually not even get cyber insurance because the price has gone up so much. Are you seeing that over in the States as well? Yeah, it's different. I think industry and vertical by vertical size of company. Uh, there's there's some industries in which it's not an option in order for you to earn a contract or do business with a, with a supplier, you're, you're required to have a certain level of cyber insurance. So in that case, you have to sort of go out in the market. And uh, in some cases, you know, companies are having to go to multiple cyber you know insurers or carriers to get a policy underwritten you can't just go to one one carrier and get get full coverage you have to go work with two or three carriers to get to get full yeah. coverage um, rates have gone up mm -hmm. as a result yep. but in some cases you know certain industry verticals k through 12s um, their rates have gone up and they've opted to in some cases self-insure right or, or take on the risk of, of not having a policy and choose to source those dollars in something that is potentially preventative in nature to make sure that they don't get attacked in the first place. Yeah, we've definitely seen that. And I mean, um, in case you weren't aware, one of the largest breaches uh, this year in Australia um, was Medibank Private, and they actually didn't have uh, cyber insurance at all. It was 2.9 million um, personal information that got breached. And um, with that with the uh, Optus breach, I think uh, of the 26 out of a million population in Australia, 13 million of, yeah. of personal <laughs> identities got breached this year. I was, in both, I was in both of them. <laughs> well done, Brad. <laughs> 
<laughs> so pivot, pivoting a little bit, um, you, you just probably, like, this one might be for you. You're responsible for the cybersecurity strategy of a lot of businesses across the globe. And you, you probably get, a, a, I guess, this question a lot of the time. What, what are your thoughts on pen testing or getting organizations getting pen testing done? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, so just like any other tool, right, I, I look at pen testing as a tool, right? So, um, I, you know, when, when we talk to customers or whether it's existing customers or prospective customers, the idea of pen testing is, is really about, in my opinion, how you make your defense better, right? So it's, it's less about just like managed awareness, like security awareness, it isn't about can you trick the user into clicking links, right? It's about how you train the user to think and, and basically build a, a, an, an, a culture of awareness. Pen testing for me is no different, which is if you choose to deploy and get a pen test done and you co-pay the you know, fifteen to $30,000 that it's going to take in your environment um, and you don't have some of the basic controls in place, their first thing they're going to tell you is to put the basic controls in place. So you haven't really like solved anything. You haven't really addressed a, a anything except for proving what we already know, right? It's like you're proving a known known, which doesn't make a lot of sense. So uh, pen testing, in my opinion, should be done after you feel like you've implemented a pretty strong security program. And then you should do it in conjunction with that security program so they can be, so you all can become more defensive, more safe. Right? Mm. And, and I think that's, that's where it comes. The other thing I'll say on this topic is the definition of what a pen test is varies greatly, right? So um, I've, seen, I've seen people do an external vulnerability scan and then report back without doing anything and saying that was a pen test, right? All the way to, you know, giving, uh, giving a, uh, a pen tester or a red teamer uh, an account inside of an environment uh, with access and just saying, how far can you move laterally? Like, like there's a large range of like what a pen test is doing. Um, and, and I think that knowing the scope of that also matters, right? Because what are you trying to test for? Um, what I've seen a lot, Jackson, is people trying to implement a pen test to get a uh, budget. And in my opinion, you should and can build a proposal that should allow you to get the security spend you need in a risk-based conversation versus here's a proof of somebody was able to breach me, right? Mm. For me, it's kind of throwaway money if you haven't done some of the core things up front, my opinion. That's fantastic advice, actually. And uh, yeah, I, I do agree with a lot of those points. And I think in Australia, if you someone quotes you a, uh, a pen test for you know less than 10 grand, you got to really start asking some questions about what are they actually looking at. Uh, there's probably a large, a different scale from what I've seen in the industry when you know, people go out for quotes of pen testing, you know, it can be, like you said, a, a basic, you know, run a vulnerability management tool and send back a report and there's your, there's your pen test or it can be a lot more in depth where they're actually, you know, trying to breach applications and do the physical, you know, walk into the, their office and drop in a USB kind of thing. So uh, there's a big scale on that. But your advice around making sure you've got the fundamentals in place first and then getting pen testing mm. and don't do that as an, as an exercise to get more budget or to start uh, getting the organization, uh, I guess, more cyber aware. That's, that's really good advice. After you have um, lifted up to that baseline and you, you've you've done a pen test, how often would you recommend businesses get pen testing done? Yeah, I, I, again, I, I think I would follow probably you know your your industry um, and if you have compliance requirements. But I think an annual pen test is a pretty standard like approach um, because look at the end of it, what you're really trying to do again is just say, hey, over the year I did all of these things to try to be more secure and bolster my defenses. How do I then bring somebody in and try to test those defenses, right? Like mm -hmm. that's what you're doing. And so ultimately you're, you're really just trying to find more cracks that you can fill coming into the next year. So I think an annual pen test is not a terrible idea, but again, here's the other side. You have to be able to act on that. So if you, if you can't, if you can't implement the, the changes or the roadmap or the things that they find within a year, and you haven't changed anything, why would you have another pen test to just tell you the same things that you had last year? Yeah. So it really comes down to like your capability of being able to implement the change that they're testing. Yeah, yeah. And, and scope and value, right? I mean, I think we've seen, you know, we run into situations where an organization has spent more money on a pen test than they would have spent for our entire service for a year. And you know, it leaves you asking, what, what would have been a better investment 
and uh, yeah. you know, would have, would have made my reputation Where's more, the value? more secure. Yeah. The, That's a little bit like cyber insurance as well, right? Like um, if you spend a lot of money on cyber insurance but don't have any security operations and you get breached, like it's all it's all well and good to have that uh, monetary covered for downtime and covering the IR and maybe in the forensics, but – uh, the reputation hits already there, and and you know you might have directors with passports out on the dark web, that kind of stuff. Uh, cyber insurance isn't really going to help with that reputation hit. Um, but Steve, this is probably the next question for you. Um, you. So Arctic Wolf expanding to Australia, um, you've you've grown like fairly quickly, and Red being your first flagship partner, which we we're, re- we're really excited about the offering. Uh, what are you, what are your plans for Australia and New Zealand? Yeah, great question. Well, number one, we're excited to officially you know, be in Australia and uh, to have our first partner uh, signed up and, and, and actively going to market. Uh, we have a sales leadership team, uh, David and Steve in, in Sydney. We've got our first uh, team boots on the ground, uh, Alex and Rolls in Sydney as well. And, you know, we'll, we'll continue to scale out the sales go to market. You know, we'll probably bring on five, six teams over the course of the next six, nine months um, and, and ramp up sales capacity. Uh, at the same time, we want to make sure that in going to market in Australia, uh, we're making the necessary investments to demonstrate we're going to be there long term, right? And so we've we've hired a concierge uh, security director, uh, we've hired uh, a customer success director. Uh, we're, we're hiring the necessary sort of post sale uh, customer support teams uh, to demonstrate our commitment to to servicing the Australian market. And, uh, we've got longer term plans to build out our SOC and data center capabilities and. I think it's it's short range, you know, three six months. Uh, but we're really excited. I think about our fit in the Australian market and and being able to work with partners like Red to, to make it reality. Mm, that's exciting, and we're looking forward to joining you on the on that uh, our journey to end cyberus down under. Um, what, what about uh, um, Arctic Wolf as a as a global organization? Um, you've had a lot of growth, a lot of change. Like Lane, Lane since you've been there seven years, a ridiculous amount of growth. Um, what's Arctic Wolf's plan for the future next? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think for us, there's there's still a lot of things to do in the current strategy we have, right? So I think for us, a lot of it is going to be a lot more of the same but better, right? And um, by the way, I think that's one thing that we have done what I would consider fairly well as a business, which is we haven't tried to be everything for everyone, right? We have tried to be very core and focus on what we do. So, so Jackson specifically, I mean, we're obviously going to always look at are there, you know, technologies, are there services, are there better things within our portfolio uh, that, that lead towards reducing risk and a security operations function. We'll always look at that and see what it makes, you know, what makes sense. Um, we will continue to invest uh, geographically and globally in, 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 our, in our go-to-market. Um, but I personally think we're going to have a, a little bit more of the same as we continue to go, right? Because there's still a lot of companies, as Steve talked about adoption, there's still a lot of companies that are still getting into the spot of what do I do here, right? And I think if you can do it better and better, that's better for everybody. Um, but let's solve and let's address the actual problem that we've been trying to address and, and have been for, you know, 11 years, <laughs> mm. right? That's my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think it's a good one too. And look, I mean, we've been able to to grow and scale by entering new markets internationally. I think we'll continue to see that. Um, we've also continued to scale our security operations platform. Right, we've added uh, new capabilities over time. You know, we started off as a as an MDR kind of pure play company. We added managed risk. Uh, we've since added you know managed awareness training. Uh, we've added you know IR capabilities uh, to the platform, and I think we'll have both organic and inorganic, you know, acquisitive growth over the coming years that'll bring new capabilities and features to our existing customer base. That's exciting. And I think your, your time to enter the Australian market couldn't have been any yeah. better, uh, let's be honest. <laughs> uh, got just the time, Brad, any other questions you want to add? Uh, no, not really. Um, look, it's, it's, it's been exciting. As, as you just mentioned, you know, it was, it was good timing. I think we've been talking for about um, well, just over six months. Um, and it's been really well received, kind of on that basis. You know, that's it's we've we've had conversations with lots of customers, and um, maybe having that conversation a year ago, it wouldn't have been that important. But um, it's being very well received at the moment. Um, so we're looking forward to bringing these solutions to our customers because I sleep better at night knowing that they have these things <laughs> in place as well. Yeah, definitely. And like Red's, Red's rolling out internally and uh, we, we honestly want all of our current customers we look after their IT to um, take up the offering as well because it is that kind of peace of mind for us because, you know, 
we know that uh, businesses are at risk at all times, even with every every tool set out in there and people looking at the best MSP or the best internal IT team. But if you can mitigate that, it uh, definitely helps us sleep better at night. So, mate, Stephen Lane, thanks for thanks for joining. I really appreciate the insights that you've um, you've shared with us today. Anything else you wanted to uh, add before we close out? No, you're doing good work. We appreciate the partnership and uh, look forward to continued success. Thank you for having us today. Yep, thank you very much. It was awesome. Awesome, guys. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Lane. Cheers. Cheers.